Welcome to Core Concepts. My name is James Renford Powell. I'm your host. As you know, if you've been going to the Renford Broadcast Network and YouTube, you know that we have for more than a year now, uh, and I'm not sure exactly how, many, how long that's been, but for more than a year, we've had spiritual leaders, religious leaders on the show, and we've had Muslim, uh, we've had Quakers, we've had Mormons, we've had uh, Indian shaman, uh, Hindus, and uh, it's quite a, quite a collection of visitors and various forms of Christianity that we've had on the show. And I'm fond of saying that always you can find almost anything on the internet, but on core concepts you can find things that you wouldn't even know to look for. And I've been asking people basically the question, what do you believe, why do you believe it, and what are you doing about it? In other words, how did you come to this belief system, and how is it manifesting in your life? And I think it's only fair that the spotlight be turned around and you can ask me the same questions. All right. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a background on, on where I've come on, this, on these things. And we have talked about why we do this. I think it's very important that people understand other people, that we know where we're coming from, we know what we believe, why we believe it. And uh, so I'm going to share today with you. We did have a guest today that was not able to be with us. So I'm going to take this opportunity to talk a little bit about my path and this process. I was raised in a Christian family, a ministerial family. And I know that uh, it might be a little bit odd, some of the experiences that I had growing up uh, compared to most. Uh, my father, I never, don't recall ever taking me fishing. Uh, it wasn't that I didn't learn to fish or go fishing. Uh, I don't think I ever had a practice session in baseball with him, but I played baseball all the way through high school, played tennis in college. But, and so the life was fairly normal, but as a young child, I was around him a lot, and he was learning various things. He was very big on memory verse in the Bible and uh, memorizing different um, things like the, the books of the Bible, uh, New Testament and Old Testament, the, uh, the uh, judges of Israel, the 12 apostles, all of these things that, that he would memorize. And even at a very early age, five, six, seven years old, uh, I was listening to this and I, and I was being taught this. This was, I think I was his hobby <laughs> that they're teaching me these biblical passages. So that by the time that I was uh, eight or nine years old, he would take me on his trips as a, in revival meetings, gospel meetings. And one night a week, he would stand me up on the pulpit and let them ask me any question that they wanted to ask. You know, and somebody may ask, who were the... Who were the three men in the fiery furnace? And I'd say Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they'd ask me uh, the, to name the books of the Bible and to name um, the twelve apostles and the, who, who were the judges of Israel: Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Deborah, Gideon, Abimelech, Tolar, Jared, Jephthah, Ibzan, Elon, Abdon, Samson, Eli, and Samuel. I can still do it. It's just so ingrained. All of these things. In fact, uh, the highlight of these. Uh, little shows that he would he would perform with me was uh, the uh, 60 generations from Adam to Christ. You know, if you look in your Bible, it says so-and-so begot so-and-so and so-and-so begot so-and-so and so-and-so begot so-and-so. So that, and, and this happened actually while he was sick. He was sick for about two weeks with the flu one time when I was little. I just playing around in, in the room. And by the time he was learning them in 10 10 people segments. And by the time that he had learned them, so had I. So I could walk around and spout these names off and it meant absolutely nothing to me. <laughs> but I could say them. You know, I could say, Adam, Seth, Enos, Kayan, Mahalia, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah, Shem, Rephax, Seth, Seder, Eber, Pelek, Ruth, Zerud, Nehor, Tiber, and Abraham. That's the first 20. And I could say them all the way through. And it wasn't until I got to college at uh, Free Harmon, college, now Freed Army University, and I was in Bible classes and I was majoring in, in Bible, uh, that I found that I didn't know so much about the Bible. 
because you can know the names of the books. You can know all the characters in there. You can even know what happened in those stories and still not know what it's about. Not have much understanding of it. All right? And while I was learning there a little different, I mean, I was beginning to learn some humility <laughs> about, about my knowledge uh, of the Bible. It really wasn't like it is with most folks, I think. I really didn't begin to learn until I was out in the world and having to work with it. I think that we, we learn how to study in, in, in school and we do learn certain facts, but basically to learn with understanding, it has to be experienced. And this is a lot about what I write about in the universal principles, the universal laws. Uh, it's important to identify them and then verify them from your own life experiences. And until you do, they're not yours. They belong to somebody else. They are a belief. Until such time as you can know, and you can know when you've been there and done that, when you've lived that process. In 1966, I went to South Vietnam during the war. And this was a mission program that was run by a man by the name of Maurice C. Hall. And I had committed to that during my second year in college. And uh, there were about 30 people there, and it was, it was a shock to the system in more ways than one. I mean, just flying in there, the way they would fly the, the airlines in there, they would come in and then drop very rapidly down into Tonsonut Air Base because of the um, uh, fire from the ground. Because this, again, is August of 66. The war is on in, in full flame. And uh, we arrived at there at the Tonsonut Air Base and coming in, it, it's, it's so different from anything that you have experienced if you lived in the United States because it was like a blue haze hanging over the city from those two cycle engines. And there was a very unruly traffic. They would just go up, it flowed like water up into people's yards and other fences and all around uh, the way the traffic flowed there. So everything took getting used to, everything took getting used to. And at the point that I moved in right shortly after getting there, uh, we moved into the Chinese section of the city called Cholan. And in Cholan, um, I went to the Saigon School of Living Languages to learn Chinese because I was working with them. And I went into a little alleyway, off of an alleyway, to learn how to write with the mouth bee, the hair, the hair pen. And, and hung around uh, martial arts centers and ping pong parlors anywhere because being uh, uh, so young, this was this were the people, these students and so forth were the, were the ones that I was working with. And my, my little group uh, was soon at around 18, 19, 20 young people and I would teach them English. And uh, we had Bible correspondence courses in Chinese and English so they could come and get uh, English training free and it was an opportunity for us to uh, to teach and that after all was the primary purpose we had to commit to studying uh, a language I, so I committed and I took that serious and I did reach a point of being able to uh, deliver my lessons in Chinese and uh, sometimes it, it was uh, awkward I, one time I was uh, speaking and uh, the word using the word uh, sunching which is uh, uh, Bible, but I was mis. There, there are four tones in Mandarin: ing, yang, sang, chu, and I was using the wrong tone, and the word that I was using was crazy. <laughs> so the students blessed their hearts. They smiled at me, and they they were they were nice, and they knew what I was saying. But but they were they knew it was kind of funny. But uh, anyway. My objective in working there with them was to establish rapport, to, to come to understand where they were coming from, what they believed. And um, so I began to read things like the Tao Te Ching and the Analects of Confucius and eventually the Dhammapada, the Buddha and different things, and looking for ways uh, or looking for things that would uh, establish rapport with them. And amazingly, I began to find that there were certain statements of principle all right, that I was finding coming from all of them. And what that made me do was go back and study the Bible a lot more. 
and made me go back and look and see what Jesus said. And I was beginning to build a matrix there with, with regard to this principle. Jesus said this, and Buddha said this, and Lao Tzu said this under that, under that heading. And that was the beginning of, the, of my odyssey of 35 now, going on 40 years of studying these universal laws. Because I believe that this is the one thing that is how they are alike as opposed to how they're different. Now if you want to, and most people will, uh, most of them, there are lots, there's many, many thousands of ministers, monks, mullahs, uh, and priests that will, will tell you how we are different. But I became uh, ena enamored with the whole idea of how much we are alike, how much they were alike, and how much what they were teaching us was similar. Sure, the doctrines, the dogmas, the rituals, and so forth are different, but underlying all of this were these same 13 principles. Now, it took a long time to come to that conclusion, and I went through periods of years where I didn't touch it, just backed away from the whole thing, but then I would always be drawn back to that study, going back and looking at that, and, and seeing that correlation and, that, and the, how those uh, principles tied together. And, uh, you know, at one point I thought there were six of them, and at one point I thought there were nine, and at one point I thought twelve, and eventually I came to the conclusion there were thirteen. Now, it was many years later before I read Aldous Huxley's book, uh, The Perennial Philosophy, where he talks about the thirteen, or Charles Hanel's Master Key, and others, and, and, and during those early Earlier years, you know, I thought I was a genius. I thought I was the only one that had ever come, had ever discovered this, had ever come up with this, had realized that that those principles were underlying the teachings of all those masters. All right, so and you will find that there's nothing new under the sun, and the longer you keep studying it, you will find that there's somebody else that has been there too. And uh, but in any event, I began to write about these, and. Um, I uh, will be covering some of those. Uh, I want to cover a little bit of that, about that with you with my books. The first, the first book that I actually published, and it was kind of a strange way that this came about, but um, I had started work on a book. Uh, well, actually, I didn't even know it was a book. I just woke up one day and realized that I had 700 pages, single-spaced, no title, and it covered a wide variety of subject matter. And it took me a while to break this out and break it out into separate books and so forth. And there were things that were happening that drew my attention to it. So I'd move away from that, that work and, uh, and, and I would work on something new. And the first one I actually published was this one here called The Mysteries Revealed. And The Mysteries Revealed is about the book of Revelation. I came to believe that it's not about the end of time. It wasn't about the, the uh, uh, Armageddon or the uh, world conflagration. It was about the process of transformation from fear-based feeling to love-based living. And in each chapter, after you get past the um, early parts where he's talking about the churches um, and uh, identifying each one of their problems, uh, you'll see that the symbology was turned up so high, the symbolism was so high that in one sentence it could be three or four different uh, symbols there. And, and it, it just came to me one day as I was looking at it, talked about vision one, vision two, vision three, and I was looking at those numbers, and I'd been studying the numbers, the base numbers, one through nine, and the fact that in every culture, whether Hebrew, Indian, uh, or Chinese, each one of these base numbers, one through nine, had a conceptual meaning. What really surprised me as I studied it was that all of them had almost the same conceptual meaning uh, for each number. So that's what led to the writing of, the, uh, of this book, the, the Mysteries Reveal. And in 89, I was in the Ozarks at a retreat center metaphysical type of retreat center and I was studying the seven levels of the mind and during that uh, period while I was up there I wrote uh, this the beginnings of this book the house that Nemo built and um, it was the first draft was 19 pages 
And I remember the man who had that retreat center was a Dr. Rothamal. I read it and he said, that's going to be real good when you flesh it out, when you fill it up, when you, when you give some character to it. See, I, I'd never written anything of this nature. And uh, it was actually four or five years before it was published. And as I layered in uh, di different things. Namu is human spelled backwards. He lives in the Valley of Nam, which is the Valley of Man. And uh, his big problem is a priest named Rafe, which is fear spelled backwards. And uh, all of the characters are like that. They're spelled backwards. He, he's, he has to deal with uh, the chief priest, Warren, which is narrow spelled backwards. Uh, he goes into the mountains to find the sage Rennie Nam, which is inner man spelled backwards. It's about his process of self-discovery. Those seven levels of the mind are still there, but it, but much more went into uh, producing uh, and eventually writing and, and uh, publishing that in that book. And then then I, I published a little book called The Searcher's Roadmap. And the searcher's roadmap, it looks like a book, smells like a book and everything else, but it's really more of an advert, it's more like a, uh, an advertising thing. It explains the basic philosophies that are being taught. It advertises the books. It gives some idea about the organization, which I formed then was called the Institute of Applied Metaphysics. And then, and this is not necessarily in, in order, but then I wrote a book called The Unity Principles because I attended, I was looking for a friend of mine, whose name now is Kata Bay, and I was looking for him. I had been in Dallas, Texas. I came back and I knew that he went to a Unity Church. So I went to that Unity Church and of course I found him, but the lady who was speaking that day was trying out to become the minister of that church. And she mentioned seven universal laws. And I said, whoa, I didn't know any church, any Christian church was talking about these universal laws. All right. So I then got a hold to material, books written by Charles Fillmore and Emily Cady. And I found that they specifically made statements about each one of those laws. And so uh, from that time on, I've had a working relationship. I've taught classes in Unity Churches and have con uh, continued to work with them. But even Bernard Dozier, who was one of, a longtime minister of the church and um, in fact was there when they built the new facility on Walnut Grove Road, said this is one of the best he's ever read of putting, the, uh, of putting word to each one of those principles in such a way that anyone can read and understand. And that was the, uh, in fact he said, uh, he, this is a book that ought to be promoted from every unity pulpit and used in unity classes and master consciousness groups. That's what he said, which is quite a nice, uh, quite a nice endorsement. And at the same time, I'm still working on that original material that I had started writing, uh, uh, putting together in in '92, and uh, and then. I wrote this book because at that time I was working uh, with people who were raising money for their new businesses. Uh, I had a, a, an interest in a business called IFEX Funding and we raised the money to raise the money. That's the money to pay for um, business plans, market research, prototypes and things of this nature. Very difficult money to get. Money that they would not get without hawking their house. All right, That's why I got into doing that. And what I was doing at that time was, of course, observing these entrepreneurs who had these ideas. And um, uh, I came to realize that basically they were their own worst enemy. You know, you have money, and uh, money is a problem, all right, but management is a problem. And you can be the best mechanic in the world, and if you don't know the process and what's necessary for, um, for running that business, it's not going to help you much. You're, you're doomed. All right? You can be the best linebacker in football, but if you don't know the rules of the game, you're going to cost the team more yardage going the other way than you will toward your goal. All right? So those rules of the game began to, to, to come into play here, thinking about this as well. And, and that's why this book was originally written. 
Now, it was much later that I was approached by uh, a man who um, uh, was a premier affiliate with uh, Bob Proctor. And if you've read, if you've seen The Secret, and um, uh, he wanted to market this book, so, uh, but he, he thought that we needed other things to, to market it with, so I had already completed this workbook. And the difference is that in the book, I mean, I'm talking about my experiences in working with them and about the laws, all right? Because they really are the process of creation. They're the laws of creation, all right? In fact, that's what Fillmore calls the universal laws, the laws of creation. And in this book, I put five exercises per chapter to help the individual reader draw from their own experiences, their series of questions and exercises to draw from their own experiences so they can identify and verify these principles from their own life. And without that process, I don't believe there's any way I don't believe there's any way to come to full understanding of God. I don't think there's a way to come to a full understanding of yourself without the process of identifying and verifying those principles from your own, from, from your life, from what you're doing. In addition to the book and the workbook, we created uh, four DVDs. And these one of the first of the DVDs can be viewed by going to uh, youtube.com typing in Renford Broadcast Network we have one up there we have six sections on uh, Renford Broadcast Network and uh, one section is is the DVD for this we also have um, the bookman show which is a television show that I do locally uh, for authors and we have uh, the core concept these shows which you you were probably viewing from there now and a number of other sections that you can benefit by. But it was, uh, that's where it was put, the DVDs for that. There's also 54 weeks of support material and online coaching. So each week, and we're actually at the moment that this is being taped, um, I've completed 49 of the 54. And we'll be doing week 50 this coming uh, Wednesday. And those shows, plus your support material, make up the, and complete this program. This is the Laws of Material Well Personal Development Program. And frankly, I don't believe, I've looked all over, I don't believe that there is a more comprehensive plan or program on personal development available anywhere. Not, not of this uh, magnitude. There are a lot of people who have classes and so forth, but this is... Uh, uh, a very comprehensive program because we're covering each one of the universal laws. This book is called the ULS Workbook and this is the first degree level. In the midst of all of this being done, established in the early 90s, the Institute of Applied Metaphysics. And if you go to www.iam-cor.org, you'll find the virtual campus of the Institute of Applied Metaphysics and this is the book for the first degree level which has all of the lesson questions for all eight books that are in the first level plus it has um, eight um, essays and each one of the essay has uh, true false questions the others are multiple choice but that's all just one level there are three levels you can view that by going to im-core.org. There are also free books. The Searcher's Roadmap book that I mentioned to you earlier and the Core Document and the Unity Principles are all free books that you can go to um, uh, im-core.org and pick up. You can also get a copy of the Lightways e-zine. This is an electronic magazine and that's all free. You can go to the bookstore. You can see all the books, the synopsis somewhat like what I'm giving you today uh, on core concepts. I wrote this little book called The Rules of the Game and that's because a lot of people don't care what Jesus or Buddha or Lao Tzu had to say about anything but they're very interested in what Vince Lombardi, Lou Holtz and Bear Bryant had to say. All right. So all of the quotes are from sports figures who may or may not know what a universal law is but they were stating it when they were quoted. 
And uh, all of the analogies are to football, right? So are using football to explain and illustrate these same 13 principles, the same thing that we're covering uh, uh, in, the, in the other books. This book is called In Search of Self. And this is probably more personal to me than any of the rest of them because it's about my process. There's 63 poems, and I didn't go back and change where I've got a, a, a strange idea about something. I, I left it the way that I wrote it. And this was scattered over a very long period of time. These are just poems that I wrote and I kept. And then I categorized them according to the 13 principles. And uh, uh, I welcome you to read uh, read this one in particular because it is uh, it, it it gets to uh, the process so that you can actually see the process taking place. And then this book, The River of Life, was written about six or seven years ago. It was supposed to be a poem to go into this book. It was supposed to be a part of this book. And at that time, I was driving back and forth between Dallas, Texas, and Memphis, Tennessee, and this poem kept coming to me and uh, I'd have to stop at, at that time I'd have to stop on the side of the road and, and uh, go to a waffle house and write it on a napkin and one thing or another and finally I wised up and got a tape recorder and I'd tape it on the, going back and forth but it was kind of a poem that wouldn't stop coming and uh, I'll read you the first verse the river runs its course with no beginning or end and all who have desired to have known it again and again it's about the it is about the eternal nature of being and uh, I'll leave it to you to uh, look at it we've been working on a film for this book going on six years uh, that's a, a rather expensive process so I just worked on it when I could afford to work on it and had people doing things on it we've already recorded all of the, the characters in it and um, uh, we're just we're at the point of collating getting all of that together and then going in and begin to add in the character words and um, uh, sound effects and music and so forth so that that's a process that's going on a lot of people don't think that's ever going to happen they never thought it was going to happen but it just I just plod my way <laughs> along with them sometimes and it'll be there this is a book called the Metaphysical Bible. This is not. This is actually uh, started out as a way of providing a metaphysical interpretation of certain passages. And there's certain passages in the Bible that are very, very metaphysical already, already highly uh, metaphorical, and uh, and so that was easy. But if certain passages like the 23rd Psalm and, and Isaiah 55 and uh, many other parts. There's also a section on here, in here, in this book, one chapter on how we got our Bible, which is uh, um, something that really doesn't get taught much. Right? And people don't realize that there was no Bible as we know it for the first 325 years after Jesus. There were letters, there were books, and there were documents that were floating around, but there was no collection called a Bible. And this was a project that was instigated by the Emperor Constantine when he called in Eusebius, his scribe, who had just completed the, the record of the Nicene Council in 325. And he told him to go find, go discuss it with other uh, priests and so forth and determine which book should be in the Bible. Most don't realize and don't talk about the fact that chronologically the New Testament is kind of back to front. The first books being written were the letters of Paul, which is 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, Timothy, Titus, Philemon. Books like Hebrews and James and others came down the track, but the last books to be put together were, were, the, were the Gospels. So this is what this book is about, and uh, I, I have seen a lot of interest a lot of people interested in that particular book. And then last year I published The Father Confusers. And of course there's no such word as confusers. Uh, but uh, I'm doing a little takeoff on Father Confessors there. So I hope, uh, hope you don't mind that, uh, my Catholic friends. 
But the, um, uh, this is about incidences in the Bible, in the Mahabharata, and in the cuneiform texts that I think were actual physical events that couldn't be described any differently by the witnesses of that time. If you take, for example, Elisha is walking with Elijah. Elijah's trying to make him go back. He won't go back. Three times he tries to make him go back. Finally, he makes him stand on one side and he crosses the river. And then Elisha describes a fiery chariot that comes out of the sky, picks up Egypt, uh, picks up Elijah and flies away. All right, now, if you think about it this way, here's a man who's never seen electricity and the only kind of vehicle he's ever seen is a chariot. And this one appears to be on fire and it comes down, Elijah gets in and flies away. All right, so here I think you have a lot of uh, physical events that are being revealed in the Mahabharata, the Bible, and the Sumerian text that are have taken on the aura of some type of spiritual event that is a physical event. We think of the Bible as being one big book, but the Bible is many books written by many writers and over a long period of time. And there are certain parts of it that are very metaphysical and there are certain parts that are very uh, spiritual, meta, uh, uh, have great spiritual uh, benefits and lessons, and there's some that's pretty gory, and, and uh, would might uh, seem to have very little value. But the point here is that uh, in this one is with is is I'm dealing with that particular aspect of things, and I don't think any of that is denigrating the book uh, as a whole. When I, when I started today talking to you about it, I was talking about the, the fact that I had done all this memory work and knew all this stuff and that I began, began to have some understanding uh, of how little I really understood about all this memory work. And then getting into the field, into the mission field, and finding uh, uh, that there are many teachers and masters who were teaching things that were similar uh, but it took a lot of personal study, a lot of time, and a lot of meditation in moving toward uh, a deeper understanding. I think that there's so much that we pass over because of our uh, trainings and the seminaries and, and the great centers of learning and the different religions and so forth that um, we have to learn their disciplines if you're going to graduate and you don't come up with a lot of new stuff there if you want the approval of that professor <laughs> and you're you're going through the process you go through that process and then you begin to learn stuff yourself when you get out and I, I in trying to understand and, and in seeing that these uh, teachings of Jesus and how they matched others and of course this is my training, this is where I was working. Uh, I began to look at, at uh, the teachings of Jesus in a, in a very different light. Uh, as I said, I was looking at how they were alike as opposed to how they're different. But I want to take you through just a, a logical step through here, a look at things. In the, the prophets had prophesied in, in the, what we call the Old Testament, that uh, there were secrets that had lain, lain hidden from the foundation of the earth and that the Messiah would come and he would reveal these secrets. And then in Matthew 13, 35, he says, All these things Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables. He spoke to them only in parables to fulfill what had been said through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will announce what is lain hidden from the foundation of the world. All right. So long before the coming of Jesus, it is prophesied that one would come that would reveal the secrets that have been lain hidden from the foundation of the earth. And then in Matthew, he's saying this is what Jesus was doing. He will open his mouth in parables. I will announce what is lain hidden from the foundations of the earth. And later... Uh, there are many, many instances and references to that, even Paul later on. But he says, I give praise to you, Father, 
Lord of heaven and earth, for although you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned, you have revealed them to the childlike. This is Matthew eleven twenty five. 25. If you remember in the book of Daniel, he's told to seal up the book of the revelations that were being given to him. It wasn't time. But with the coming of Jesus, he would reveal these secrets. The disciples approached Jesus on one occasion and asked why he taught in parables. And basically he said to you, and he says, because knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven has been granted to you. But to them it has not been granted. And basically, this is Matthew 13, 10. Basically he's saying, I speak to them in parables because I have to speak where they can relate to it. All right. And we find a problem even today relating to these parables. These little stories. They seem too simple. And we, we gloss over them, we cover over them. Where in fact, in each one of these parables, he's revealing one of these universal laws, one of these principles that I'm talking about. Every parable is illustrating or explaining that. And every time he says anything, he's explaining or illustrating one of these laws. So it came home to me at one stage during this process that there must be something more important about these laws than all the doctrines, dogmas, rituals, and all the other goings on that go in in the religious world in the churches. This is the key. This is the heart. These are the secrets that were laying hidden from the foundation of the earth. Now you have a very, and, and as I mentioned earlier that uh, Paul said something about this too. He's, he said, uh, according to the revelation of the mysteries kept secret from long ages. This is Romans, you can read it yourself, Romans 16, 25, 26. So before Christ and after him, there are many, many references to this process of the secrets that had lain hidden from the foundation of the earth and now being revealed. Now, I want to take you to another point here. And I'll let you, you see how important I think these rules are. Uh, and I've talked about it in relation to sports and everything else, that you could take your baseball glove and equipment and go play on a football field all day long. You won't be playing football, you'll be playing baseball. The rules define the game. You can watch, uh, and I know there are probably a lot of women who would... Um, agree with me, you can watch a football game and you see all these guys running around banging in each other, it means absolutely nothing to you. <laughs> Until you know the rules of the game. This is what defines it. And these laws that have lain hidden from the foundation of the earth really define the game of life. And what Jesus was doing was revealing the rules that govern the game of life. Right? With his apostles looking on Jesus made a very, you know, a startling statement, in fact. He said, I glorified you on earth by accomplishing the work that you gave me to do. Now glorify me, Father, with you, with the glory that I had with you before the world began. This comes straight out of John 17, 4. Anybody can go read it. All right, it's not that he's saying that he was in the beginning that is so startling. What is a little bit startling for, and was for me was that he's saying that he's already accomplished the work. He's saying, I glorified you on earth by accomplishing the work that you gave me to do. What was this work that he gave me to do? Remember, this is before the crucifixion. Now, this is before the death, burial, and resurrection, which is pretty much covered by Christian ministers everywhere. We talk about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We see this first talked about very strongly by Stephen as he was being stoned to death in the presence of Paul. And he says, you crucified the prophets, and now you crucified Jesus. So the death, burial, and resurrection story holds premier in, 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 uh, in, in Christianity today. But here's Jesus saying that he's already accomplished the work. <laughs> I've accomplished this. I've glorified you on earth by accomplishing the work that you gave me to do. What work was he doing? He was speaking to the people in parables. And without parables spake he not. So it follows 
that what he was revealing in the parables were the secrets that had lain hidden from the foundation of the earth. Now I invite you to think about that not so much as a matter of theology but as a matter of how important these laws are to our very breathing. Right? We have all of these physical laws, the law of gravity, we have the laws of physics, but behind that, before that, we have the spiritual laws in the process of being manifested. And these are the secret city that, that, that Jesus taught in those parables. Now this is, um, if you look around the room where you're sitting, look at the tables, the chairs, the clothes that you're wearing, everything had to exist in someone's mind before they could possibly exist physically. Everything is the process of the unmanifested becoming manifested. Everything that we see is this process. Right? And these secrets are the secrets that Jesus revealed. I want to take a few moments here to uh, talk just a moment about some of the ways that you can get material and you can find out more. If you found the, the uh, Renford Broadcast Network, you'll find that there are links there that would link you to our, the Renford, uh, from the Renford Broadcast Network to Radio by Renford. We have 10 shows per week. We have the Cosmic Contact Show on, on Mondays at 6.30 hosted by Pam Drennan. And then we have the Searcher's Roadmap show by the same day, hosted by Keith Blanchard. The name of that show is being changed, and the, and the Searcher's Roadmap show will remain, and Keith Blanchard is beginning his own uh, show. We have the I Am Well show on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. These are all centered Central Standard Time. Uh, this is hosted by Anna Miki from Holland. We have the No Show on Wednesday at 7, hosted by Reverend Robert J.V. McMillan. And, uh, and then I have the Laws and Materials show at, at 8.30 uh, on the same day. And then the Progressive News Weekly show comes to you from New York, hosted by Daryl Clark. And that's at 5.30 Central Standard Time. Dream Vision 7 Radio out of Boston, Massachusetts. We have a working arrangement with them. We publish, we have two of their shows on RBR each week and two of our shows go to them. This is a uh, organization that has a listener base in 125 countries. And we have two, two shows a week from them and one of them is at Friday, it's on Friday at 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. And then on Saturday we have Night Search. This Night Search show will be moving to Tuesday night Night Search is hosted by um, Eddie Middleton, and this show has to do with um, alien intervention, paranormal, ghost, and it's uh, sort of like a coast to coast type of uh, show. And then Dream Vision 7 on, again at 3 p.m. On, on Sunday, which is the other one from Dream Vision 7 Radio. Now, we have two new shows that are beginning, Reggie Jenkins, uh, one of the founders and, and uh, president of Soundtown in Memphis, Tennessee, which was a, uh, a very successful uh, record production company in the 80s. We'll be, doing, uh, we'll be starting a show soon. And Rhonda Harrison from Red Feathers, Colorado, who is my moderator now, will beginning, uh, we're beginning to take over the Searcher's Roadmap uh, Show. So I want to invite you to do that. I want to invite you to go to look look more uh, look past uh, just the shows that you've seen on the Renford Broadcast Network and uh, look at some of the other sections. There's an audio book section. We've also got the Renford Theater, which is um, a link to a lot of shows you might find uh, there that you can't find somewhere else, like The Secret, or the What the Bleep, Cirrus and uh, many shows of that nature you can access through, uh, through uh, Renford Broadcast Network and Radio by Renford. I want to talk just a moment about a book that's coming out soon which was part of that original uh, writing 
that I told you about the 700 pages single spaced and uh, that I didn't have a title for. That, that book will be published this year. It's called The Core Teachings and it goes into detail on everything that I've been talking to you today about. This uh, a book is a book that you can read like any other book, front to back, or you can follow a color code that uh, takes you on one particular principle all the way through. You can go, you take the law of attraction or the law of being or, or any of the laws of the, that we talk about here, and you can see what the Vedic writers said about it. You can follow through and see what the Tao Te Ching said about it, what Lao Tzu said what Buddha said in the Dhamma and the Zen Master said, what Jesus said about that, those particular, each, each, that particular principle, and what Muhammad said, and all the way down through uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson and James Allen, and the, light, the last uh, teacher that I felt was of such quality, who left us last year, uh, Dr. David Hawkins and who, is, who wrote uh, Power Versus Force and The Eye and The Eye and The Eye and other books of that nature, very powerful books. But this is a way, I think, if you follow that color code on any one law, I really do not believe it's possible for you to read that all the way through and not relate to the, that principle taking place in your life. And after all, that's the bottom line. That's what my objective is, is for you to be able to identify and verify that principle in your own experience because when that happens a paradigm shift is taking place you're no longer operating like the, the person watching the football game and not knowing the rules you know the rules of the game of life because you've been there and done that there's a difference there's no one. and I make the promise to you today as I do to anyone about any of the books I'll make you three promises and then I want to close the show. One is that if you are able to identify and verify each of these principles from your own life experience, you'll never be walking down the street wondering what hit you. You'll never be working in a befuddled state. Why? Because you've been there and you've done that and you've identified and verified that principle. Secondly, you'll never be sitting in a coffee shop wondering what hit you and what I'm going to do next. If you're in a coffee shop, it's because you're planning your next move. It's not because you don't know where you are. Because if you've identified and verified those principles, you do. And the third promise is, if you've identified and verified these principles, every time you hear a speaker, watch a show like this, listen, go to your, your, your church, or go to a seminar or workshop, or even have an extended conversation with someone, you will know where they're coming from. You'll know whether they're talking doctrine and dogma, ritual, or whether they're talking academia, just what they've learned, what they've studied, what everybody else says, or you'll, learn, or you'll know whether they're just blowing smoke. Hmm. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to say to each one of those people, you're blowing smoke, or you're talking this. It's important only that you know, that you recognize. And that's, that's a promise. All right? I want to thank you for being with me tonight and uh, listening to my tales, uh, my path uh, through life. And I uh, hope you will be back with us for another one of our guests on Core Concepts next week. Have a good evening. It's only when that's happened that we actually come into harmony. This is the harmony mm -hmm. that... Um, that um, Fillmore was talking about and the reason for that and, and you'll see the correspondence between the 12 powers because you got one of them is love, mm -hmm. one is renunciation, mm -hmm. grace, all of those in there are like shadow laws mm -hmm. but, but they're because they are our innate powers mm -hmm. it's all there and it's all for us to become aware that we have those and in, and in expanding them, Fillmore says, the purpose is so that we can come into harmony with the laws. And because somebody has actually gone in and identified and verified each one of the principles, doesn't mean that there's, a, that there's no ongoing process. I hear people talk about enlightenment like uh, 
once I'm enlightened, I don't, I mean, I've actually sat with a woman who told me I'm enlightened. I, I spent time in India with, uh, uh, with Sai Baba, and I'm enlightened. Mm -hmm. Well, you won't be long, because it'll fade. Mm -hmm. It's an ongoing process. The, the, one of the most interesting things about the parables is that Jesus reveals stuff in there that we don't cover, we don't think about, we don't talk about. Mm -hmm. and if you take the parable of the talents, one gets one, one gets two, one gets five, all right? Mm -hmm. The one that got two and the one that got five, what was their reward? They didn't go in, they didn't go, they didn't get 72 virgins. No. They didn't go to paradise with milk and honey. They got something for it. They didn't get great riches for it. They got, they got something though. The reward was more responsibility. Go read the passage. Go read the, top, the parable. They, they get the one that was buried. No, I haven't got to him yet. Just the ones, okay. the ones that were successful in doing what they were supposed to do. They were productive. Mm -hmm. Their reward was more responsibility. Gotcha. Right. The one who buried it revealed another secret, mm -hmm. very powerful secret, and he just comes out and says it. The master said, why didn't you put it in the bank? Make me some money. He said, I know you were a strict master, and I was afraid. There's your devil. Mm -hmm. There's your problem. There's the thing that paralyzes everybody. If you look at everything in life, anything in life where you failed, it's always fear at the heart of it. Fear is the nemesis. In fact, Charles Hanel said, this is the one enemy you must destroy or it will destroy you. You have to reach the point where anytime there's fear there, you face it and you walk right through it. Because it has no power but the power you give it. And you've got that. You, you've got that in the. the uh, you think about it in in the book of Revelation. This is all said in a metaphorical way. It says the beast was cast into the abyss. What's an abyss? A bottomless pit. What's a bottomless pit? Something that has no fa no basis, no foundation. No foundation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it. not real. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a term for it in Unity. I hear people say uh, false evidence. Appearing real. Appearing real. It's not real. Mm -hmm. As opposed to forget everything and run. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not real. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I answered your question exactly there or not. But no, you, you did uh, uh, a few a few sentences before. Mm -hmm. Very very clear. Mm -hmm. Very clear. Um, especially uh, the the idea that just when you think you got it, you mm -hmm. discover that there's more to get. Yeah. There's there's an ongoing process. I don't know, frankly, where we go to a different dimension and we have another planet on another planet or we have go through a process. I don't know all of that. I haven't seen that even though I read that from Paramahansa Yogananda's master, mm -hmm. Sri Yukshur. Mm -hmm. He said he moved, he would, that when, when he contacted he was in another planet he was teaching or, or another dimension, mm -hmm. you know. But I think this process is ongoing. Good. It's an ongoing process. I don't think I don't think there there's a, a time where nothing happens. That's just not God. Everything is changing. That's one of the laws, the law of evolution and unfolding. Everything is moving. Everything is going on. There is no there's no such thing as an end. Yeah. Why? Because all of the lessons are in the journey, not in the end. Mm -hmm. So it's always a process of learning, of knowing, of coming to know. And I, 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 I don't, I think that a mind once expanded can never be contracted. I don't think you really lose that. But I think you can fall into the trap, uh, you can fall into, uh, can get lazy and allow fear to take control again. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, so even once one, um, can say they've, under, they've identified and verified the laws, they understand it, then it, it means that this is, this is time to get moving mm -hmm. with your purpose for being here because now you have all your powers collected. 
And that's what you said at, at the very beginning, uh, that uh, their, uh, uh, the verification of the laws uh, allows for there to be, oh, allows for there to be um, uh, an application for it. It, it comes with a meaning uh, in order to bring you to another level. You didn't say it exactly like that, I'm paraphrasing it, but, uh, but you were very, very clear uh, about the meanings of, uh, of getting the laws. It's more than just knowing it, uh, it's the comprehension uh, to the point of a knowing this. Making it yours. Know that you know it's yours, yes, instead of someone else's. You know, you, you can actually see this in ball games. You can see the flow going back and forth in sports. Mm -hmm. But you can actually see when a team knows. <laughs> yeah. there's, something that, there's something that changes. You can see it with people. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, uh, it's, it's kind of all of a sudden, and they may not even, are not really fully cognizant of it, but you know when they know. Mm -hmm. When, 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 in their minds, it's already finished. It's already completed. We talked about that today in the class. Yeah, it's really good too. And I go, you know, one of the worst things you can do, you know, I can say, I think that I have put together the most comprehensive personal development program around. But if I rely on that alone, I never know. So I come to a class by Eric Butter, uh, by you on Eric Butterworth, mm -hmm. all right? If, 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 if you reach the point that you think you know it all, look, it's time to go. You don't need to be on this mortal coil. Mm -hmm. If you know it all, it's time to move on. Yeah. So as long as there's something to learn, you can stay and learn it. <laughs> <laughs> Life is a school. Yeah. As long as you breathe, you're enrolled. And, and don't ever think that you know it. You, you know that there's not anything else that you can't learn because almost if you just read the same passage over sometimes in the Bible, or you go back to another class, you're going to pick up on stuff that you didn't that you missed that you didn't quite get the last time. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs>